today we're going to be talking about the Sphinx Breed presentation that was actually uh, made by me for the 2019 uh, Tika Annual that we had. And this is online, but I think it's just sometimes a little easier if we go over everything and if people have questions afterwards, we can discuss them and hopefully everybody leaves here with a better understanding of, uh, of our breed standard. So to introduce myself, my name is Shante Burris. For those who don't know me, I am the Tika Sphinx Breed Committee Chair. And I have today helping me and Charlotte Joseph, who is a wonderful Tika judge. And she's also my region, the Mid-Pacific region. She's our regional director. So I'm very happy to have her helping me today with this. Uh, so the Sphinx breed was actually accepted into Tika as a championship breed in 1979. And a lot of our standard actually hasn't changed from that time. So ho hopefully this is going to be educational for people, but uh, we do have two little changes that are going to happen to the Sphinx breed standard that we're going to discuss as we go down the list when we get to them. And uh, so let's get going. So everybody knows the most kind of notable thing about the breed is obviously the hairlessness. But for those of us who love Sphinx and know them and have them in our homes and stuff, we know that the best thing about them is actually their personality, their disposition. They are extremely affectionate, uh, very dependent cats, much more like a puppy uh, or a baby than, than an actual cat. Uh, they're not truly hairless. A lot of people think that they are, but there, there is actually no truly hairless breed of cat. They all have hair follicles. The Sphinx has a fine down head to toe, and some of them do actually produce more coat on the feet, the tail, the muzzle, the nose, and the, the hind legs as well. This is actually acceptable in the Tika breed standard. We're allowed to have some amount of fuzz on the feet. We don't like it to go past the ankle and we're allowed to have hair on our tails too. Again, don't like it to go uh, a full blown coat, but the overall structure of the cat is a lot more important than being ultra, ultra hairless. So some amount of fuzz is completely fine. They do have sometimes broken whiskers. Uh, you'll see little curly whiskers. I'm sure all of us have seen our cats have one or two that maybe last a week until they fall out and then they might grow another one. An interesting thing to note is the other hairless breeds of cats, the Peterbald and the, the Donskoy, the Peterbald coming from the Donskoy, uh, their hairless mutation actually it, it has various uh, coat types but the bald variety of a Donskoy mutation, they can have full proper whiskers like a regular coated cat. So a good way to tell them apart for the layman is if you see a hairless cat that has full whiskers, you know automatically that it is impossible for it to be a, a sphinx or what some people refer to as the Canadian sphinx. So look at the whiskers, if they have them, it's not a sphinx. Sphinx only have those little crooked, curly, cute whiskers and they can have them, they can, be completely missing them. Either way, it's totally fine for the show ring. They're not a small or dainty cat either. A lot of people assume that a sphinx, because it's hairless, is a, a thin or sleek or slender cat. We, by no stretch of the imagination, do we have an elegant breed. Uh, they're nice and thick. They have round abdomens, good full rears, nice thick thighs. Not at all a dainty, delicate cat. And the males in our breed standard, we do have allowances for them to be 25% larger than a female, provided we still maintain the proper correct proportions. So we don't want them to be absolutely enormous, but we also don't want a frail or delicate or dainty refined looking breed as well. And their temperament is sweet, lively, uh, very intelligent, and they must be amenable to handling. That is in our breed standard, so you can't have a cat hissing, scratching, and tearing up a judge as it's coming out of the cage. We need to keep that personality in the show ring just as much as we have to have it at home. So this is how the point breakup is for our breed standard. We have in all of the head section, we have a total of 40 points. It's broken up into little uh, sections like the size and shape of the head, the muzzle and the chin, the ears, the profile, the eyes, the neck. And then our body is 30 points. 20 of those points are in torso, five in legs and feet, five in tail, 25 in skin and coat, and five in color. 
Recently, that's one of the changes that is likely going to happen to the breed standard. I wrote a proposal to remove the five points that we have in color and instead put them in torso, which would be uh, the, the abdomen region of our breed. Our breed has a very unique description for the abdomen. No other breed of cat has it. We specifically call for a rounded abdomen, a full appearance as though they just ate a meal. This is very unique. No other breed, like I said, no other breed has this. So uh, I think putting emphasis on this very special aspect of our breed is important. The color having five points is doesn't really make much sense because we in the Sphinx breed, we can have any color, any division, it doesn't matter. You can show a white Sphinx, a black and white, pointed, mink, tabbies, anything. Anything goes for Sphinx. So having point delineation for something that we, we don't um, take away from or, or give more to, it just doesn't make sense. So it's just to make the breed standard a little bit more representative of the special parts of our cats and what we want judges to really be appreciating when we bring our cats up to a show. The head, arguably one of the breed's most eye-catching features, uh, per perhaps second only to their appearance of hairlessness. There are sometimes two varying head types in the breed. You'll see some have a slightly shorter wedge-shaped head and some have a slightly longer wedge-shaped head. Both fit within the breed standard. The breed standard's verbiage is very open and fluid to interpretation. The head is slightly longer than wide. And using that term slightly, it's very ambiguous. It's, it's very open to interpretation. Slightly for you might be different uh, than slightly for me. So that's how we come across two very slightly varying head types in the breed. This is also caused by uh, the various outcrosses that we use. In Tika, we're allowed to use domestic short hairs, American short hair, and Devon Rex. And depending on if you're using Devon Rex or domestic short hair, that might alter the look of your cat for a couple of generations. And once the cat is hairless, once it looks like a sphinx, it's allowed to be shown. So if you have a, a sphinx bred with a domestic short hair and an F2, two generations out, your, your cat is not a, an American short hair, and two generations out, your, your cat is hairless, it is allowed to go into a show and exhibit alongside the other Sphinx. So you can have a slight difference in the facial structure of the cat, depending on your outcrosses, but both fit within the breed standard. You don't want the cat to look like a hairless Devon. You don't want it to look like any tones of, of exotic short hair. We're not talking about a head that is that short, that extreme. Everything about our breed should be moderate, except our ear size. We want those huge ears and we want big eyes, but it's not a breed that is drastic in any sense, like a Persian or a Siamese or something like that. So we don't want any influence or, or strong influence of Devon Rex, exotic short hair, but we also don't want them to look like a Cornish Rex or a Donskoy with a longer profile. So it's important to keep that in mind. So the head is medium sized, medium wedge with rounded contours. Uh, what we say when we say wedge, think of a like an isosceles triangle and just round out those corners. That's a modified wedge. The head is slightly longer than wide, like we just discussed, slightly. <laughs> Um, the skull is slightly rounded, but it does have a flat forehead. So if you're looking at the cat in profile, you'll see a nice flat top to that forehead. And that also helps our ears look even bigger than they are. And when you don't have more of a dome skull, we have very prominent cheekbones under those eyes and a distinct whisker break. What a whisker break is, a lot of people don't know what that term means. It's when the muzzle has a distinct difference from the cheekbone. So it kind of pinches in or it breaks that line. There's other breeds that have nice smooth lines. I think the Siamese is one of them where the muzzle just smoothly goes into the cheekbones and into the rest of the wedge of the head. With Sphinx, we want the muzzle to look as though it's popped onto that face like an afterthought. So it, it, it's not blended in to the jawline and the, eye the cheekbones of the cat. These are some examples of heads for females. We do have different um, photos for the males because with the jowls, that does drastically change the, the, the shape of the head sometimes. The breed standard allows for jowling in males and they can be substantial in our breed. Some other breeds have very substantial jowling as well. 
we have it in Sphinx too. So all of these girls fit beautifully within the breed standard. They have nice width to the head as well. You want some good distance in between those eyes. We don't want them very close together. You can see all of the ears are placed really, really well on the head. Not too high, not too low, not flared out like a Siamese or going with the wedge of the head. They're just kind of nicely in between, moderate. Everything is moderate. Here are some examples of males. You can see in some of them, uh, especially this chunk over here, the jowling is really substantial. When they get jowls, uh, it does fill in some of the flesh around the muzzle and the cheekbones. And this can kind of um, reduce the, the look of those nice curved cheekbones. So we do have allowances for that in the breed standard. And we, we want them to have basically the same type of head as a female, just more masculine. Just you want to look at the cat and know that this is a male. Now we're on to cheekbones. One of my favorite parts of our breed, they are prominent, well-rounded cheekbones that define the eye. They form a curve right from the muzzle uh, up into the, the top of the eye and into the skull. And allowances should be made for jowls with the males because that can reduce the appearance of the curve of that rounded cheekbone. Here are some examples of cheekbones. These are males and females. So you can still see even with the jowls, we, we still have nice cheekbones. So this curve is what we're looking for. Nice and full curving, shaping that eye and framing it beautifully so that it really becomes a, a eye catching feature when you look at the face straight on. And they need to be nice and rounded, symmetrical and very prominent. The muzzle and the chin. We have in our breed a strong rounded muzzle with a distinct whisker break, firm chin. The only description we have of the chin in our breed standard is that firm chin. That's all it says. The muzzle should have the appearance of kissing a window. What that means is we just want it to look very, very prominent, proud, puffy, and in your face. So kind of like they're, they're puckering up. The chin needs to be really firm and well-developed because it's the foundation of the whole head. If you don't have a strong chin, they're not going to have anything to support that nice perky muzzle either. You'll end up with a muzzle that kind of droops down a little bit more. So the chin is really, really critical to the entire overall look of the head. Uh, and that's why we changed or we put a proposal through to put a little bit more emphasis on the description of the chin. So it's not just simply firm chin. I just don't think that that is descriptive enough. Here are some examples of muzzles and chins. You can see how rounded they are, very puckered. Every one of these cats looks very kissable. Nice firm chin. When you're looking at the cat from the front view, you kind of want the, the chin to really support that muzzle. You see how, how it's going from side to side. It's nice and puffy, it's prominent. There's good depth to the chin as well. The depth is the height from the top of the mouth to the bottom of the chin. So there's nice, good depth, it's balanced. If this chin ended right here, you can see how drastically that would change the whole look of that face. So we need a nice, full, rounded chin that is a good enough depth to support the entire look of that very full muzzle that we have in our breed. The muzzle should also be wide. You don't want a narrow muzzle. You don't want it to be um, an, anything like snipey or, or reminiscent of a breed that has a more snipey muzzle like the oriental breed types. The head, ears, very large, broad at base and open. They're set upright, so that means nice and forward. Neither set low on the head or on top of the head like a bunny. The interior is totally hairless, but we are allowed to have some amount of fuzz on the exterior of the ear, the backs of the ear, and sometimes there's tufts coming off of the edges of the ear here. That is completely acceptable. These are examples of ears. So we like a rounded tip on the ear. We don't want it to be so round that it gives the impression of like a Mickey Mouse ear or anything like that. The ear base should be very broad, broader than it is at the tip so that it does have a nice taper to it not conical the way a Cornish Rex would be. Um, Cornish Rex ears are 
almost as wide at the base as they are at the tip, which gives a much more conical appearance to it, more rabbit-like. The Sphinx is wide at the base with more of a tapered rounded tip. All of these cats' ears are set really beautifully on the head. For the ones where you can see the eye level, the corner of the eye, the exterior corner of the eye, lines up with the edge of the ear on each of these cats. That's what you're looking for with the ear set. In kittens, you might sometimes see an ear that's a lot lower on the head. That's completely fine. Muscles and structure as they develop, raise up those ears into the correct position, uh, depending on the lines, of course. And with studs, sometimes when they develop the jowls, you can have a male that has high ears up on top of the head. And once the, judge, the, the jowls develop, the weight of those jowls can actually alter um, the positioning of the ears and pull that outer edge lower, giving the appearance of a correct ear set. But we always have to keep in mind that how that cat is going to breed or produce is how he looks younger. You have to discount the changes that the jowls have created uh, because jowls aren't gonna help a female kitten, jowls aren't gonna help an alter. So you don't want to, uh, kind of get locked into the misconception that your cat's correct ear set is correct because it just is, you have to take into account that it is possible that perhaps the jowls have an effect on that. So looking at a male prior to puberty like that is more effective of, at um, discerning his breed type or, or how his ear set is in terms of the breed standard. The profile, this is something I'm really crazy about. I'm, I'm a bit of a profile nut because it's what I struggle with the most in my breeding program. I think all breeders have their little things about the standard that they're more particular on if, if they have trouble with it. Uh, so the profile for me has always been something I have to work very, very hard on to produce. It actually took six years of work before I was satisfied with, with what I was producing consistently. And even still, uh, I come across a profile I'm not proud of. So it, it happens, it's always a work in progress for absolutely everybody. So our profile is a slight to moderate stop at the bridge of nose. This is the second proposal that was passed that is in line with the chin. The proposal that was passed is to change the wording from slight to moderate stop at bridge of nose to slight to moderate visible change of direction at bridge of nose, some degree of fuzz on bridge of nose. So I think that the change of direction is a better description for what we're looking for in the profile. This is that change of direction right here. You have a nice straight nose, that's the bridge of the nose, and that right before the eyes, you have a change of direction up into the forehead with that nice flat plane right in front of the ears. It, pre previously or currently, it's referred to as a stop in the breed standard, but that term is actually a term that we use for breeds that have much more significant or sort of severe uh, cha changes of direction or profiles. They, ha I think the Devon Rex uses stop to uh, describe its profile. Um, I believe American Shorthair, British Shorthair. So these are all breeds that their profiles are nothing like what we're looking for in, in the Sphinx. They're a lot more severe. We want more of a gentle change of direction. Nothing in, in our breed, apart from our ears, is supposed to be um, extreme in any kind of way. It, again, very moderate, nice and smooth and curved and just an overall really pleasant appearance. Um, and having the word stop just, I think it, it doesn't give the proper visual impact. And I think it's a little bit more confusing for new people who are reading this standard and seeing that this word is used for a lot of profiles that are completely different to our own. So if this passes the uh, board of directors, we will have our profile described as a slight to moderate visible change of direction at the bridge of the nose. Why we're putting visual in is because it's really important that we have a, a nice, obvious change of direction when the cat is moving around naturally. We don't want it to be something where the skin is yanked back from the forehead in order to show that it has a very minute change of direction. So we, we want it to be visual. Now, the fuzz on the bridge of the nose is actually very unique to the breed too, very important to include because it sets us apart from the other hairless mutations that we see in Tika, which would be the Donskoy and Peterbald mutation. 
and as well as the hairlessness of the Lycoi, the new breed Lycoi. Those breeds hairlessness or semi hairlessness actually produces a completely hairless bridge of nose in their hairless forms. Not like Sphinx. With Sphinx, we have that fuzz on the nose at all times. Even if you have a Sphinx that is in extremely, extremely hairless with you know rubbery ears and just completely hairless, they will still always have some degree of fuzz on the bridge of the nose. It might be extremely short, but it must be there. We never have that shiny, leathery look to the nose. That's only seen in the Donskoy, the Peterbald, and the Lycoy. So it's important to, to make that differentiation. And it's also a really easy way for the layman or for pet owners to, to be able to discern whether or not the cat that they're seeing online is a Sphinx or a Donskoy. Or, or potentially a mix. Uh, if it is a mix, it would be Donskoy predominantly since that mutation is dominant and Sphinx is recessive. So here are some examples of profiles, both moderate and slight. This one down here is what I would call a slight profile. So it, it is quite straight and it just has the slightest little change of direction up into that flat forehead. This is completely in line with the breed standard, just as much as a stronger profile like this would be. Uh, you can also see here the differences in the lengths of head. This is a much shorter length of head than this one over here. All of these fit within the breed standard and are completely um, each beautiful in their own right, each you know uh, adhering to the standard beautifully in their own right. And it just kind of falls down to cattery looks, preferences. Some people prefer a slightly longer head. Some people prefer a slightly shorter head. And we're allowed to have those preferences in our uh, breed standard. So we can breed to what, what kind of pleases our eye individually while still having uh, a cat that can have a lot of fun and success in competition. The chin, when we view it in a profile view, should line up uh, with the end of the muzzle. Each of these chins lines up really nice. This cat in particular, uh, I'm pretty sure a toy was being waved around. When, when you do that, when you excite the animal, you puff up the, that muzzle a little bit more because it's, it's natural for them to want to extend their whiskers that they don't have. And the chin kind of gets pouty, but you want to look at that depth of chin. It balances really, really nicely with the muzzle. Nothing looks extreme or odd on our breed. Everything just fits beautifully. Everything is a nice, careless kind of balance. We have ourselves a really lovely breed. So this girl here, you can see how that chin lines up beautifully with the end of the muzzle. It has a great depth to it. It supports that muzzle so that when you look at this cat from the front view, you see a nice, rounded, perky, full, plush muzzle. The eyes large rounded lemon. A lot of people assume uh, that we just say lemon shape for the eye, but the breed standard specifies that this is a rounded lemon. So we don't want a squinty look to our cats at all. We don't want um, a hooded look or we want a large rounded open lemon shaped eye so that when you look at them, that's what gives them their sweet expression. That, that's what gives most breeds their sweet expression is their eye shape. And whenever you have a large eye in that face, it's just automatically going to have a more kitteny kind of appeal to it. And that kitteny kind of appeal kind of makes us feel like the cat is sweeter, cuter, more innocent. That's what we're going for. We want that large round lemon shaped eye. It is slanting. The outer corner slants to the outer corner of the ear. That's kind of a very easy gauge for how we uh, see if the ear set is correctly on the head. And there is slightly more than an eye width in between the eyes. That gives us the width of the head that we're looking for so that we don't have any kind of head that is reminiscent of a Cornish Rex or um, any kind of oriental breed type that we see in Tika. Here are examples of eyes. They come in all colors. Colors don't matter at all. Some judges might have preferences, but like I said, color on the coat, color of the eye means absolutely nothing on our breed. We don't have any color faults like other breeds do in terms of density of color or intensity of pigment. We don't see any of that in Sphinx. So it's just up to what you prefer 
or you could ignore it altogether and concentrate a lot more on structure type and things like that that are actually important for the breed standard. This is a paint job. It's nice, but that's all it is. What we're looking for instead is the shape of that eye, the curve to the top, the curve to the bottom. You want it to be pinched slightly at the corners. That's what makes us look, that's what gives us that lemon, that rounded lemon eye right here, pinched in the corners. Otherwise, you would have a, um, a, a rounded globular type eye like a Persian or an exotic short hair. So even the large rounded lemon shaped eye, it still pinches in those corners. And that's what gives us that look. We do sometimes see, I have one myself, if she comes uh, that has an incorrect eye shape. But we do see some that have a hooded look. So if this lid came down lower and was flattened at the top, that would be more of a hooded look. It would completely alter the look of the cat. We don't want there to be so many wrinkles that the weight of the wrinkles lowers that eye, that upper eyelid shape and makes the cat look stern or angry or irritated. We need them to be large, open, alert, and that gives them that friendly, sweet expression that we love from our breed. The neck, it's medium in length, rounded, well-muscled. It's not um, thick and, and cobby like, a, like some of our, our other breeds, like a British short hair or an exotic, or an exotic short hair. It's, it's a medium length, medium, medium, medium. That's kind of the, the trend here in our breed. It arches uh, gracefully from the neck up until the base of the skull. It's powerful in males. You can see uh, a, a lot more thickness to the neck, but you still want length. You don't want the neck to look like it's just sitting on top of those shoulders. You, you want there to be some um, shape and arch to that neck so that when the cat is moving around, it just looks very balanced. The body. This is very important to me because I don't like seeing skinny sphinx it's it's a pet peeve of mine medium sized not large sorry Groot they're not it's not a giant breed it's not one of our biggest breeds out there it is a medium sized breed the length of the body is important too it's medium to medium long in length you don't want it to be so short like an exotic short or a Persian but it's also not supposed to be very long and elegant like any of the oriental breeds it's it's a it's right in the middle it's a medium breed so medium size, medium length to the body, a broad chest. It might tend towards barrel chested. This is when the whole chest and, and uh, rib cage looks big, thick and rounded. That is completely fine in our breed. We want there to be a lot of muscle on the chest. We don't want a pigeon chest, which is when you can see that sternum protruding, that bone here protruding. It's unappealing. When we see that, it means that there's a lack of, of muscle definition along the chest that's kind of covering up that bone in normal cats that have proper chest. And it also happens when we have a weaker boning to the breed. This is a medium boned breed as well. Uh, they have the rounded abdomen. They look like they just ate a full meal. They are not supposed to be fat. We don't want to overfeed our cats so that we get a cat to the show ring and it's got this big dangling belly and everything is jiggling around and you pick it up and it feels like a bag of wet Play-Doh. It's supposed to be muscular and firm, shockingly heavy when you pick them up. They, they do uh, have substantial weight sometimes compared to what they just look like, but not a fat cat. The leg length is proportionate to the body. Everything is very balanced, very proportionate. Nothing is supposed to stand out to you. Everything is just a nice pleasant appearance all as one, like a whole package. The hind legs are slightly taller than the back legs. So when you're looking at the cat walking in profile, you'll see that the back arch is a little bit upwards. The feet are medium sized. They're oval. They have long slender toes. They have thick paw pads, very, very thick paw pads. The tail is whippy rat-like tapering from the body to the tip. So it's not like uh, Bengals, some other breeds, we like a thick tail all the way to the end. With a Sphinx, we want it rat-like. We want it to be this weird little rat tapered little tip. Length to the tail is important too. That's something that I actually have to work on in my breeding program actively because I sometimes tend to have shorter tails than other people are getting. So we, we all have our little things that we have to tweak and work on and it's, it's, always a, it's always a work in progress. 
They should not be delicate or refined in boning at all. They should not be small, dainty, frail looking, sickly. This is a well muscled breed. It is strong. It looks strong and healthy when you're looking at it. And, uh, and we need to keep it that way. These are examples of female bodies. Each one of these girls has great little shape. You can see the length to this cat here. She is not super duper long, but she's not very short with a short, short spine and kind of smushed together. There's some good length. The chest is smooth, beautiful, nice and wide. When you're looking at the cat from the front, a good way to tell the width of that, that chest is see where those legs come down off of the chest. If they're kind of really, really close together when the feet are down, sometimes that can give an indication that the, the chest is just not wide enough to accommodate that spread of the legs. And another good way to tell is actually from behind the cat. Stop looking at the chest and look at the shoulder blades. See the distance in between those shoulder blades. See how many fingers you can fit in between those shoulder blades. And that's going to, to give you a better idea of the structure of the chest not just if the cat is standing in an attractive way, but if it actually structurally has a good width of chest that accommodates those wide shoulders in the back. So that's a good way to tell. Uh, very muscled thighs. We like a big booty in our Sphinx. They don't have delicate rumps at all. Nice full abdomens, powerful, powerful cats. Nice and medium, but powerful. These are strong cats. Really nice full rear on this girl too. Beautiful stomach. She also has a stunning chest. Her legs are still elegant looking, still pretty, but they're not dainty like they're going to snap in two if she jumps off a table or something. You can tell that she is a strong cat, but she still has a beautiful leg that is very feminine all the same. So we still want to achieve that feminine look. If our legs were too short, if we say cut them off right here, you would see that that leg would look a lot thicker, a lot cobbier. We don't want that. So we still need to have a nice length of leg to the cat, but by no means a tall greyhound look or anything like that. Medium length that is proportionate to the body. Here we have males, my favorite. Uh, these are nice, strong males. This is a, a, just a perfect body. The, you really can't get much better than this. Super muscular chest, nice medium length to his, his body, good depth of flank right here. So it's the distance between the top of the back to the belly line. You don't want it to be really short with a tuck up uh, like we see in Cornish Rex or other breeds. It's a nice depth of flank, a very thick muscular thigh area, good strong belly when you pick them up. This is the same cat here actually nice strong stomach. He still doesn't have legs that are so thick like tree trunks. There, there's still some um, medium impression there. It's not thick and cobby, but it's not weak by any means. The males do sometimes have a, a bigger bone than the females, obviously, and our breed standard uh, specifically accounts for that in, in that we can be 25% larger in males than we are in females. But you still have to have that same balance that we, we require in the female. So you still want there to be a little hint of, of elegance in the, that leg, a pretty leg, not a big thick tree trunk. We, we want them to be pretty and we want that nice full belly, not fat. These are all really big boys. Not a one of them is fat. They're just powerful. When you pick them up, if you've held um, some other uh, strong, thick breeds, when you pick them up, they do feel different composition-wise to other cats. So if you've ever picked up a Bengal, those cats feel like, uh, I mean, they feel like a python body. They're, they're just very, very firm under the skin, very hard under the skin. And a sphinx is even a crazy muscular male like this. They are squishier <laughs> when you pick them up, but not fat. We don't want fat. We do like a bit of squish in our cats, but we don't want them to be fat. So a little bit of a primordial pouch is completely acceptable. None of these males really have them, but primordial pouch is totally fine, but you don't want it to be a big meat flap, you know, hanging between their legs. It sounded bad. Uh, the legs and the feet. So they are in proportion to the body, like we already spoke about. Medium boning, females are allowed to have slightly finer bones. 
So a little bit more elegant, nine legs slightly longer than the front. The front legs are wide to accommodate that broad chest. And the feet are medium size and oval in shape. Toes are long and slender. And they are prominent, uniquely thick paw pads, giving the appearance of walking on air cushions. Again, we see this because we just don't have fur on, on our feet. So the, the paw pads become extremely apparent. Body, the legs and the feet. Here are some examples. So as we spoke about earlier, not thin and delicate legs, but still pretty, but medium and boning. This is a male. You can see the difference between the legs in a male compared to a female right next to him. So you want it to be feminine in a girl, a little more masculine in a male, but nothing too thick and cobby, uh, just a nice medium boning. The tail we discussed, rat-like, very whippy, very long, something I always struggle with. There is a lot to be short hair on the tail. You can have, um, you know, even like a quarter of an inch of coat along the entire tail is completely fine. You want it to lay smooth. It's not supposed to be a thick coat that bushes out and is really, really apparent. You don't want it to detract from the tapered, whippy look of the tail. You still want it to have that same appearance. There is allowed to be a lion puff. Again, this standard was written in 1979. The lion tail was something that we saw in earlier generations. I. I can't remember the last time I saw a lion puff on, on a sphinx, but I already wrote two proposals and I didn't want to write more. <laughs> so maybe we'll tackle that in a year or two. Uh, but yeah, the, the lion tail is still acceptable as per the breed standard. I don't know if any of us have ever seen one that had a lion tail. That's, I saw one maybe 10 years ago. So it's just not something we see really anymore, but we still allow for it. Here is some beautiful tail. So this is one that is more coated. If you look closely, she does have uh, fuzz all along the whole tail, but she still has a tapered look. So there's some thickness at the base and it still tapers off into a thinner point. This is a beautiful tail and it really illustrates the, the length that we wanna see. It's, it gives the cat an elegant look to it with that length of tail. It's nice and, and refined, it's whippy, it's um, expressive, which we want, but we just want a nice, thin end to that tail. Nice rat-like, which creeps some people out, but I'm sure Sphinx lovers really appreciate their beautiful tails. The coat. This is one of the most important things about our, our breed for the standard. So it appears hairless, but we have a fine down head to toe on the cat. So it never has a tacky feel to it, or it shouldn't. It wouldn't be correct if they have a tacky or a sticky or a rubbery feel. They should feel like velvet. They should feel like a, like a warm peach, or if anyone has ever had the pleasure of touching the velvet on a horse's nose, that to me is the perfect description of, of a sphinx coat. It should feel like the velvet of a horse's nose. It is almost impossibly soft, a bit silky, but not at all rubbery or tacky or sweaty or sticky. When you touch a sphinx, it should be nothing but pleasant. No matter if you like hairless on a cat or not, it, it has to be an extremely pleasant touch regardless. The breed standard actually describes it as chamois-like. Um, it might be my age, but uh, chamois is not, it's just not really a texture that I think my generation uses in our lingo very often. So I actually had to get my hands on on a chamois and, and see what it felt like. And, and yeah, that's actually, it's, it's pretty accurate. It's a little bit more resistance than I like to feel uh, on a Sphinx. I, I want it to be as soft as, as anything could ever be. That, that's always my goal with the, cat, with the cat skin. I want it to be where you touch it and, and you've never touched anything more beautiful in your life. That should be what we're going for because that's the main part of, of our cats. It's, it's how they feel. It's when we're cuddling them and hugging them and sleeping with them at night. We want that skin to just be incredible. It should be thicker than a regular cat as well. The thickness of the skin is very important because it, it kind of adds to a healthy appearance. When we have really, really thin, thin, thin wrinkles, a lot of times this is caused by dehydration in the cat. Um, it, it's also kind of looks sickly if you have paper thin little wrinkles everywhere. So you want some thickness, some plush, uh, 
healthy appearance to that skin. You want it to look nice and strong and full and healthy. And a sphinx skin also is a lot stronger than a regular cat skin, a coated cat skin. The reason being, from the moment of birth, they're exposed to everything. They, they have exposure to the elements in our home, you know, it's different than the womb, to bacteria, to potential injury, to different um, textures on their skin, blankets, our, our floors, our counters, everything. And this, this exposure, this chronic exposure to the skin just makes it innately stronger than a cat whose skin is perpetually covered. It's similar to the skin on our palms, very strong, heals very quickly, doesn't scar very easily versus the skin on like the inside of our arms, which is a lot more delicate or our armpits doesn't get touched, doesn't get exposed to much things. So it's like that. So a sphinx is like a hand and other cats are like armpits. The adults should retain as many wrinkles as possible, especially on the head, but it's very important that we don't go overboard with wrinkling. We see heavy, heavy wrinkling in some other breeds, um, N namely dogs, the Sharpe and bulldogs and things like that. And those wrinkles, they foster a lot of bacteria because of the humidity that they retain, especially around the eyes. If, if cats, um, if they have a little bit of tearing from the eyes or something, and you have all of those heavy, heavy wrinkles around the eyes, that those tears, that, that liquid, that humidity is going to stay in those wrinkles. It's going to promote bacterial growth fungal growth, uh, and, and we just don't want it. Everything that we do in our breeding, everything that we do in our cats, everything that we require of our breed standard should still be safe and healthy for the cats. That, that has to be the priority. We can never put aesthetics over health and comfort of the animal. So I will admit that physically, I find an enormously wrinkled cat, an excessively wrinkled cat, I, I find it very aesthetically pleasing. I like seeing a brain face. I just, I love, I like the way it looks, but I don't breed for it despite it being my preference because I don't find it healthy and I don't find it comfortable or good for the cat. So it has to be in moderation when we compare and prioritize health over the aesthetics. So we still want them to have as many wrinkles as possible, but while maintaining proper health of the animal. And like we discussed earlier, you don't want the wrinkles to be so heavy and prominent on the eyes or under the eyes that it changes the appearance of the eye shape or it gives them a stern or angry um, look to them. So they still have to be able to maintain that large open lemon shaped eye. And we don't want it to hood that upper lid or detract from the arch, the curve to the lower lid if there's too many wrinkles there. And we don't want it to be so excessive that it, it impedes the cat's normal function of opening and closing their eyes or it promotes um, health concerns or, or is detrimental to their health. We like a lot of wrinkles on the shoulders, the thighs, the armpit area, in between the chest. None of that has anything bad to do with the cat, so go crazy. I've never seen one that was so overtly wrinkled in those areas that I felt it was detrimental to the cat. And we like that skin to be nice and thick. So this girl here, you can see the wrinkles on her shoulder blades are nice and thick. It's a plush, healthy looking skin. She looks like a chubby little girl, very healthy in all regards. That's what we're going for. We, we want there to be a nice, a nice healthy look to the cat and the wrinkles help with that healthy look when they're thick and full and evenly spaced everywhere and evenly shaped. Coat examples. So the coat, unfortunately, that's not something that we can uh, go into enormous detail with online because we can't touch the cats. Uh, if, if we were in person, it would be wonderful to touch all different types of skin quality and, and to see what you prefer um, because it's also up to individual judges too. Some might like them to be much more hairless than others. And unless we specifically put it in our standard that this is the exact degree of hairlessness that we want, this is the exact feel to a T that we want, we allow them to have their own preferences with our breed just like we allow breeders to have their own preferences in the way or the trajectory that they want their breeding program to go in regards to how they are adhering to the breed standard. But you want it to be a clean skin, obviously for showing. This is super important. In my opinion, I find the Sphinx to be exceptionally easy for grooming for a cat show, but that might be because I was a, a professional groomer for 18 years and I've dealt with a lot of hair. So for me, a Sphinx is a, a walk in the park. 
but we want their ears to be perfectly clean, perfectly presentable. Every tiny nook and cranny, which can be a lot of work, uh, has to be completely spotless. Eyes, nice and clean, no little eye boogers, no dirt or debris around those wrinkles or the upper lids, keep everything perfectly clean. The toes, we clean the nail beds, the nails have to be wiped off. You want every aspect of your cat to be in perfect spotlight condition, uh, especially when they're pale or, or the white ones can be exceptionally difficult. But the skin needs to be free of blemishes we have it a little harder than other breeds that can have scratches all over their entire bodies and you can't tell because they have a coat covering everything up unfortunately in sphinx we don't have that so our cats have to be in even better condition than every other cat in the show hall because we have no hair to hide things we, we can't hide imperfections so that kind of makes our breed uh, a little bit more hard to to show i guess a little more prestigious when we have one that is in impeccable condition without any marks but if they do get scratched up by siblings by by friends in the house it's not the end of the world yeah beep beep because um they heal really really quickly which is which is lucky so uh if we have scars on the cat i know um some people like if you had a, a biopsy done or something like that you might have a scar on the cat judges are are um generally very very understanding and accommodating of that because it's it's something that we we have absolutely no control over but in terms of scratches around the neck the face rub marks some some things you know they you come home from work and all of a sudden there's a big rub mark on their neck and you have no idea where it came from that stuff happens but in terms of showing you want the cat to be perfect and you want to be representing your cats in that way too. So if your cat has abrasions or did get scratched up or something, I mean, this happens, we, we all know it, it happens, but maybe consider not, not showing it because every time you bring a cat into the show ring, it's representing you, it's representing you as the breeder or your breeder that you got the cat from and your entire breeding program. So it's, it's really important that we're, we're exhibiting our cats in their finest days every single time. You know, if, if I've had shows where I've had to uh, swap out a cat or, or change it for a different entry because the cat got scratched and you, you just, you want your cats to be presented at the pinnacle of, of, of their peak. You know, you want them to be as beautiful as they ever can be when you're showing your cat. So we want a nice clean skin. In terms of color, like I said, any color goes. A lot of uh, judges have difficulty with the color of a sphinx as much as breeders and owners have difficulty with the colors of their sphinx, the best thing to do is to DNA test to make sure that you are registering your cat in their correct color. Um, but again, in probably in a couple months when the board discusses the proposal, we might not really have to worry about that so much anymore, but it's still important for our pedigrees that we are putting our cats in the correct colors. Uh, the Tika is a genetic registry and we wanna be accurate with what we're saying we don't want there to be errors and pedigrees for colors that don't genetically make sense. So uh, what we're looking for is a nice smooth skin. We don't want there to be excessive for, thank you, around the face, the um, cheekbones, a little bit of fuzz on the nose, totally fine and beautiful. And, and we want that, but we want an overall nice, even look to the coat. I, I prefer them, even though we're allowed to have fuzz on the feet, the tail, up until the ankle. I prefer a more even look. I just find it's more pleasant to look at. So I'm not a huge fan of big boots in the show hall for Sphinx. I like it to be a more homogenous hairlessness head to toe. But that's a personal preference because the standard says that we can show with fuzzy feet. Uh, so color, like we said, all colors are, are allowed. An easy way to determine if uh, the cat is dilute or not in Sphinx, the easiest way is where the color is gonna be more saturated on the cat and where the color is gonna be more saturated, the pigment will be more saturated, are the areas that have the most hair. So if they have more hair on their nose, the color of the nose can be really indicative of the actual color of the cat. So sometimes blue and black could be very difficult to tell apart. Like this is a, a blue cat and this is a black tortie and white, that's a, a black and white blue and white, uh, blue tortie and white, blue tortie and white. We have a lot of torties here. 
But when they're younger, the easiest way to tell if it's black or blue would be the edge of the ear. It's very pigmented and you can tell the edge of his ear compared to the black edge of her ear. And then it becomes very apparent because if we just look at this black patch back here on her thigh, it's a little bit more muted in, pig in pigment. It's a little bit more muted in saturation of, of melanin. Uh, and it, it does resemble him very much. So if we look at the outer edge or, or the edges of the ear, that's going to be the most accurate in determining the pigment of the cat. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work out if we don't have uh, the color we're looking for. In, like if the cat is a white and something, it doesn't always help, but it, it's, it could be a useful trick to tell. An accurate gauge of pigment would be wherever there's coat on the cat or if the, the tail is coated. Uh, we penalize a cat that is overly small. We penalize a cat that has a body that is too thin, frail or appearing or delicate, refined boning, but also too cobby or foreign. So it goes both ways. I will say that I have seen cats in the show hall that are very, very thin. And a lot of times verbal allowances are made for, oh, she must be in heat or, oh, she's just growing or this or that, but the cat should be judged on the way the cat looks on that day, not what you project the cat might look like with a couple meals in it. So it is important that we do penalize an overly small cat. They're not supposed to be small. We don't have a small breed. We don't have a thin breed. We don't have a delicate breed. Uh, we also penalize a lack of wrinkles on the head in between the eyes. There, there has to be wrinkles there. It's very rare that I have ever seen a cat. This is something that we were seeing a lot earlier on, maybe 20, 30 years ago, we were seeing a more tight appearance to the face, kind of like they just went through Botox or a facelift. That's not really something that we're seeing too often anymore, but it's very important that they always have wrinkles in between the forehead. This ex excess skin, it's inevitably gonna cause wrinkles because as soon as the ears go up, that and it's gonna scrunch together all of the, uh, the abundant skin in between the, the ears on the forehead. A significant amount of hair above the ankle is also penalized. And if they have a non-amenable disposition, I know this bothers some people, but I think most cats, every standard, it's, it's universal that they have to be amenable to handling. They have to be good for handling. Uh, I think in some breeds, especially breeds that we boast, the greatest disposition of all time, which is the Sphinx. I think it's more important that we, um, we put more emphasis on that and, and we really make it an important part of our, our cats throughout the judging and everything that they're amenable to handling. So I personally don't like to see a cat hissing on the way out, hissing on the way back into the cage. Uh, we want them to be sweet and open and affectionate and comfortable with new people as well. And, and that's part of the friendliness of the breed. It's, it's not a breed that's a one person owner. It's a breed that is very open with its affection to anybody. That's why they make such great therapy animals. And that's what we wanna see in the show hall too. So I think it is important that we, we do keep non amenable disposition in our penalizations for the breed standard. Withhold all awards would be any indication of wavy hair or suggestion of a Devon Rex either shaved or, or in molt. So um, here's a good example, actually, that's on my lap. I don't know if you could see her, but this is Beep Beep, and she is an F2 from Devon or X Outcross. And her, you can see her body is pretty hairless, but I don't know if you can see this, but there is a here, big tuft of fuzz on that butt right now. And that would withhold all awards for this cat. You don't want to see that. She has periods of time where she's, uh, the, oh, well, this is actually beep beep right here. The, the airplane ears is beep beep. But we don't want to see that. Sometimes with our breed, we have changes in the amount of coat that they have. Sometimes they grow pig hairs for one month and then they get super bald the next month. Sometimes they're nursing and they'll grow patches of fuzz on their rump and on their shoulder blades. Sometimes they're fuzzy prior to birth and they're super hairless while they're nursing. Beep Beep usually has a full tail of hair. It's gone. It's been gone for six months. I don't know where it went. I don't know if it's coming back. She had it for years and it's just gone. So we do have fluctuations of coat growth in the breed. It's not just universally the exact same year round. It changes through many different things. 
Diet can change it. Weight, obesity, being too skinny can make them grow hair. Uh, hormones, so if they're in heat, if they're nursing, if they're lactating, if they're pregnant, all of these things can change when we spay and neuter them, if they're intact. Everything has, uh, can have an impact on the hair growth of the cat because the mutation KRT71 that causes hairlessness in our breed, it has variable expression. So it's, it's a kind of a fluid, ever-changing mutation. It's, it's not just stuck in the way that it is from birth and that's it. And the whole breed has the exact type of expression of mutation. We have a lot of variation in it. We likely have a lot of mutations that cause hairlessness. We know of the one, but we likely have a lot that contribute to our cats and our breeding programs. Genetically, we can DNA test them for the one hairless gene that we know of. And there are cats that present as sphinx uh, that have only one copy of that mutation and one copy of an unknown. So we likely have multiple mutations of hairlessness responsible for the phenotype of our breed, but we know of the one of them. And then on top of that, we have polygenes that play a huge effect on the, the code of the cat, the amount of fuzz that's developed or not developed. So there's a lot of um, fluctuations in the coats of our cats, but if they have fuzz on the... Uh, but like you just saw with beep beep, that would be a withhold all words. She would get nothing. She would have a good time getting felt out by, by a judge, but then she wouldn't, she wouldn't win anything. So we, we do have that as a withhold and we disqualify if there is any evidence of plucking, shaving, clipping, hair removal, that is not allowed. We have to show our cats completely natural. We can clean them. We can make sure that they're pristine clean, but we cannot depilitate our cats or remove hair in any way. And there's no point in doing that because if we do, the cat is going to breed as the cat naturally is. So if you take your cat and your cat is super bald when it's being shown, it's just going to make you hairy babies anyways. So it's important that we're not uh, faking our 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 breed or, or our mutation or the expression of our mutation, show them naturally. If they have fuzz on their feet, that's completely fine. I've had tremendous success with showing a cat that has boots on her feet. Everybody adores her. She does very, very well. So it doesn't matter, you know, don't, don't be anxious if your cat has furry paws and you're worried and you think you need to remove the hair. We are not allowed to remove the hair on Sphinx. That is very, very, very important. I want to stress that it, it's it it's not allowed. Um, if if you want to rub the the whiskers a little rough or or a little excessive till they plop out, that's that's fine. <laughs> but but we don't we don't uh, shave our cats at all. They they are shown naturally. That's it's a unusual concept if you consider in dogs and stuff like that. We can alter everything from paw shape to rear leg angulation with a good groomer. That's what I used to do for a living. So in, in dogs, we do alter a lot of the, the, the appearance of the animal through uh, very careful grooming. It's, it's an art form. But in cats, we show them naturally. So our cats are actually just super beautiful and it has nothing to do with the way that they're, they're groomed or, or we switch things up on them to make them look good on that day when they're naturally walking around our house super hairy. So that, those are important things to note, especially for new people that are interested in uh, showing their cat. Don't shave them. Plus, it'll just grow back. So I'd like to thank all the photographers that let me use their photos. Here is a list of them. Some of them are, are actually available to um, photograph your own pets at, at shows like Helmi and Diana Starr from Starlight Photography and Tetsu. There's a lot of them. But I'm just really appreciative that they let me all use their photos because I would have had a really hard time with this presentation if I didn't have all of these gorgeous cats from all these different breeders to, uh, to show to you all. So that is it for our presentation.